All right, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another virtual star party hosted by Vanderbilt University Dyer Observatory. I'm Dr. Billy Teets, and I'm going to be one of the presenters and the MC for the evening as well. So we've got some great presentations lined up from folks from the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society, Memphis Astronomical Society, Bayes Mountain Park and Planetarium, uh, the University of Illinois at Springfield, and then our friends in uh, McGill Inst Space Institute in Quebec, Canada. So we're looking forward to uh, the evening and believe it or not, some of us actually have some clear skies for once. So we may get to do a little bit of viewing. Um, first of all, I want to encourage everyone that uh, as you're watching this on YouTube, uh, please be sure to log into YouTube so that you can uh, take part in the chat because one of the things we really enjoy about these evenings is being able to take your questions. So as we go through a presentation, a question pops in your head, be sure to pop that into the chat and uh, we will try to answer as many questions as we can during the presentations, or I should say after each segment of the presentation. And then uh, at the end, we'll do a final Q&A to try to wrap up any final ling lingering questions. So um, if you go to dyer.vanderbilt.edu, there are a few resources on there, um, including our monthly astro calendar and our brand new newsletter. In fact, the March newsletter was just released. And uh, one of the things we really wanted to highlight were some of the famous names of, uh, of women astronomers who have made huge impacts on the various fields of astronomy. Uh, throughout history. So I encourage you to go to that, check it out. Uh, you can even download a copy. And what makes it really fun is that there are animations and uh, other fun types of multimedia built into it. So um, again, that's the Dyer homepage, dyer.vanderbilt.edu. Um, I also want to thank my uh, colleagues behind the scenes, uh, Helen Morissette, uh, one of my co-workers here at the observatory, as well as Brian Smokler, uh, who is getting our signal out to everyone tonight. So uh, big thanks to them. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. So we're going to go from Tennessee all the way up into uh, to Canada, and we're going to visit uh, with Tim Hallett, who is a PhD student at McGill uh, University who is working in planet formation theory. Uh, he says he is especially interested in the physics uh, that underpins exoplanet observations. For example, what processes may be responsible for the features that are seen in the demographics of exoplanets. And then most recently, he's been trying to understand the compositional mixing between planetary cores and their atmospheres, which is a mouthful, and what large scale signatures this physics uh, can produce in the overall exoplanet population. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tim and he's gonna teach us about some exoplanets. So Tim, please take it away. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I'll just share my screen here and get my slides up and running. So uh, yeah, like you said, I, I work on exoplanets. So I thought what I would do tonight um, is kind of give a rundown of how we've made so much progress in the past um, about 20 years. In particular, what different ways people have um, figured out to find exoplanets. Um, so at, at, to date, I think there's about 5,000 confirmed exoplanets. Um, more than 5,000 unconfirmed. So we've made enormous progress in the past, maybe 10 or 15 years, it's gone from a couple hundred to 5,000. Uh, mostly that's due to technology, but of course you have to figure out how to use technology effectively um, to find planets, which are hard to find. So my first slide here is kind of just a, a rundown of the solar system. Everyone on the call probably knows this, but of course these are the planets of the solar system. So the sun at the left part of the screen, then we have um, the inner planets inside of earth, out to Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, and then we have the ice planets, um, Uranus and Neptune. But the point here I'm trying to make is that, um, as Isaac Newton said, almost you know 340 years ago, um, for 300 years, these were the planets that we knew about. So everything we knew about planet formation and their structure and their dynamics, um, for 300 years up to like 1995, these were the planets we had to work with. Um, so Newton said 300 years ago, something like, if the fixed stars are the centers of similar systems, they will all be constructed according to a similar design. So he was extrapolating to say that our solar system may not be unique. And if there's other stars with planets around them, they might be constructed similarly to, to how our solar system is constructed. And um, well, what I'll talk about is how we've made such progress in trying to answer this question that Newton proposed like 340 years ago. So the first method that people... Um, um, developed to find exoplanets is um, very straightforward. It's called direct imaging and it's all in the name pretty much. 
Um, you point your telescope um, at a star and you prefer preferably you have a, a big piece of glass on your telescopes, like a massive telescope. <clears throat> Um, and you wait to see what you see in the telescopic image over a period of years. Um, so you directly image the star and you wait long enough and you stack exposures for years um, to find planets directly imaging them. So the, the video I'm showing is a system called HR8799. Um, and this is, a, this is a, a stack of images from like it, like it shows 2009 up to 2016. So this is a very long study of this planetary system. But what they're doing is they're just pointing the big glass telescope at Keck and they're just staring at this planet for, or this star for, uh, for a period of years. And you can see a bunch of um, giant planets in this case. So these are at like, you know, 10, 20 AU distances. These are very far out. These are cold planets, much further out than our own uh, Jupiter, our own giant planet. Um, but you can see them directly in their telescopic image. So this is one way of finding exoplanets and this was the first way people developed to find exoplanets. And of course, like the, the image I showed, this is kind of what Galileo did to study the moons of Jupiter. You just point your telescope and stare at the object and wait to see what you can see in your image. Um, but of course, this is it's difficult to find planets that are small with this approach. So planets in HR8799, even though this is a beautiful video, they're all massive giant planets. If you're interested in finding like Earth-like planets, for example, um, this is not a good way to do it. It's very difficult to find planets that are close into the star and are not um, giant planets because you just don't see they're not bright enough. Um, so they don't show up in your telescopic image. So the next way that people developed um, uh, exoplanet finding capabilities is a uh, radio velocity method. So this is a method that was developed to find the first bona fide exoplanet actually in 1995, um, which won the Nobel prize in um, 2019 for the first fully confirmed um, exoplanet discovery. So what the, what the idea here is, is you, um, you watch how the light emitted from a star that hosts an exoplanet orbiting it, how the light um, shifts in time as the planet and star orbit each other. So the cartoon I'm showing in the corner shows a planet orbiting a star. The star is the big white circle and the planet is the small white circle. And of course they, they orbit their center of mass. So the star has a bit of a wobble because gravity works both ways. It feels a bit of a wobble from the planet, not only the planet from the star. And what that means is as the star wobbles, the light emitted from the star that we pick up on Earth, it's shifted in frequency ever so, ever so small as it moves away and then back towards us and back away from us. So if you're very careful and you make very, very uh, delicate measurements of the, the light from these stars as they orbit and their planets orbit them, um, you can pick up variations. And you can pick up, um, um, changes in the frequency of the light that give you an estimate of the, the planet mass that's orbiting it. And again, of course, it's much easier to find giant planets this way because they have a much bigger um, gravitational effect on the star. They have a bigger wobble. The star wobbles more if there's a giant planet orbiting in the star than a small planet. Um, but this is one, this is maybe the major way of finding um, a planet's mass is through this radial velocity method. Um, and this was, this is still very popular but again, you're limited to giant planets. So I think the, um, the major uh, breakthrough in terms of finding smaller planets that are not giant planets, that are not Jupiter size, but are more like Earth size is um, the transit method. And this was what the Kepler Space Telescope used when it was launched in 2008 or 2009 to find smaller planets than Jupiter. So Jupiter's about 300 Earth masses, huge, uh, but we're looking in terms of Kepler, um, it was looking for something like an Earth mass, 10 Earth masses, much smaller than Jupiter. So you can't really use radial velocity or direct imaging. So they use what's called the transit method. And it's actually very simple to understand as well. Um, you look at a star with your telescope and you wait for a planet to orbit the star in front of your field of vision. So it, it blocks out some of the light from the star um, as the light gets hit, it, the light impinges on the planet instead of your eyeballs as it uh, orbits in front of your field of view. Um, so it's not difficult to understand. And the depth um, of the, the light curve here, so the brightness versus time that it's showing, the depth is proportional to how big the planet is, of course, right? So a larger planet will have a bigger um, effect on how much light gets blocked from the sun, right? A small planet has a little bit of a dip in brightness from the star and a big planet really blocks a lot of light. So you can pick that up easily. Um, so this is one way of getting planetary radii, which are very important, right? Jupiter has a radius of like 10 Earth radii or 11 Earth radii. 
Um, but an Earth-like planet would have one Earth radii or a couple Earth radii uh, in size. So this is one way of finding smaller planets. Um, and Kepler, the space telescope that used this method, uh, it was able to find thousands of planets that are a few Earth, ra Earth radii large and a few Earth masses large with this um, method. And there's a, there's a, um, a secondary method related to transits. It's called a transit timing variation. And the idea here is that you can time how long a transit takes if you have one planet orbiting a star. So right now we're just timing how long it takes for this planet to orbit. And we're, you know, it, it passes in front of the star in our field of view. You can time how long it takes. If it's on its own, if it's an isolated planet orbiting a star, it takes roughly the same amount of time each orbit, right? Orbits are periodic. Um, so we know how orbits work and you can figure out the radius of the planet. But the the um, the wrinkle here in complexity is that if there's a planet in the in the uh, the planetary system that is unseen, so it doesn't pass in front of the star, but nevertheless it orbits the star. So, for example, um, I'll let this video play a little bit longer here. Oops, go back. Um, let me just fast forward here. So the wrinkle I said was that if there's a second planet that's not passing in front of the star, but it's there nonetheless. Um, you can pick up small deviations in the timing of the transit of the planet that you do, that you do see um, through gravitational perturbations with the secondary planet. So this planet is orbiting and it's, it's transiting. The secondary planet is not, so you can't see it. But if you time the transits for the planet that you do see or transiting in front of the star, they are systematically offset. So one transit is longer, the next tra transit is shorter. Uh, and the reason is because it's getting gravitationally nudged by this outer planet that you can't see. And if you take, again, very, very careful measurements, you can work out if there's a second or third or fourth planet that you don't see um, gravitationally nudging the planet that you do see. And you can get an idea about how many more planets there are um, that you're not seeing around a given star. And I think the last method that I'll outline is called microlensing. Um, this is kind of a it's going to be very important in the next couple of years. There's a telescope that NASA is launching called the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, I think in 2026 or 2027. And the idea is to find planets that are um, way more numerous. So it'll be able to find thousands and thousands of planets relatively quickly once it's launched um, through something called microlensing. And the idea is that um, gravity bends light. So Einstein's theory of gravity tells us that gravitational fields bend light as light passes through them. And if you stare at a star in a piece of sky, um, like we're all doing tonight, hopefully, if the skies are clear, and you wait for another star in the field of view to pass in front of the star that you're looking at. So the idea is you stare at a star, you wait for another star somewhere to randomly just pass in front of the field of view. The light that you're staring, the light from the star that is uh, deeper in your field of view will get bent around the gravitational field of the, the star between your field of view and the star you were originally looking at. So maybe, maybe a diagram will help here. Um, so this is your field of view, the, tel the telescope. The star you're originally looking at is up here. Yeah, I hope you can see my mouse. There's a planet and a star that pass in front of the star you were looking at randomly. And their gravitational field bends the light. Um, it acts as a lens. So here's our star that we we're looking at star and planet pass in front of your field of view, the light gets bent, gets uh, magnified and lensed. And if there's a planet around the this, this star that passes in front of your field of view, um, it gives a very specific um, profile in the brightness as a function of time, if you look at the star for long enough. So there's, a, there's an increase in brightness here because there's a lens and there's the big spike here, it's very thin, but there's a big spike. And that's because there's a secondary lens from the planet um, that's orbiting the star that randomly passed in front of your field of vision. Um, this, is another, this is just another uh, visualization here. So it's brightness as a function of time. There's a big spike where the planet is, another spike where the star is, and then we're back to the baseline brightness from the star we were looking at originally. So I'll just, uh, I think I'm probably close to 12 minutes already. I'm gonna skip all this. So I think I'll just end in my last minute or two here, just by talking about the future and why microlensing is important. Um, with Kepler, Kepler was a telescope launched in 2009 and it ended its mission about 2018 or 2019. And Kepler was able to find planets that are smaller than Earth, so one, less than, um, or larger than Earth, sorry, so larger than one Earth mass, and something between 
one and a thousand Earth radii. But most of the planets that it found were like four Earth masses or five Earth masses and four Earth radii, five Earth radii. So they're, lit, they're what we call super Earths. They're a little bit bigger than Earth, but they're not giant planets by any means. And all those planets were pretty hot. They were close into their central stars. They had orbital periods of like 10 days roughly. So much, much closer to their stars than Earth is. But for Roman, uh, because it's fundamentally different, it's not using the transit method, it's using microlensing. It's a completely different method of finding planets. It will be able to complete um, the planet census that the Kepler Space Telescope began in 2008. It will be able to find planets that are smaller than Earth, so less than one Earth mass, less than one Earth radius. It will be able to find planets that are further away than Earth, so beyond 365 days in orbital period. It can find planets that are giant planets. It can find many, many, many types of planets, larger sample than Kepler. And it will complete um, the census pretty much of the, the exoplanet population in the, um, at least the nearby Milky Way. And this image just kind of shows the plan here for um, the Roman Space Telescope. So this is the Milky Way or a cartoon version of it at least. And Roman here, here's Roman in our, um, our, our neck of the woods and our spiral arm. And its plan is to point straight into the center of the Milky Way because there's many, many stars. The density of stars is very high if you point straight into the center of the galaxy. And that increases your chances of finding stars that can act as lenses, micro lenses, to find planets around um, these field stars, what they're called. Um, so we're just basically looking for random um, stars to pass in front of the field of view and give you a lens to find planets. Um, and probably, and once it's launched in 10-ish years, maybe less than 10 years, um, it will complete the census. And we'll have a really good understanding of how many planets are Earth size, how many planets are Earth distance away from their sun, how many planets are larger. Um, so I think it's probably been about 12 minutes. I'll leave it there and I'm happy to take questions and hopefully I, um, I was sort of clear explaining all this. Thank you very much, Tim. Yes, that, that was a, a great overview of uh, the different ways that um, astronomers are finding exoplanets. And um, as folks are coming up with questions, I had a, a couple of questions. Um, was there any particular planet discovery that just kind of knocked your socks off, for lack of a better phrase, or anything that you know really got you excited? I, yeah, there is one thing. I'll, 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 I'll share my screen one more time. There's a small yeah, please screen. do. And we've got uh, a few extra minutes. So if you'd like okay. to show some other things, please do. So, so what, what I'd like to share is, um, so it's not one particular discovery, but uh, really the gift that Kepler gave us um, over its mission, it completely revolutionized planets in general. Like there was nothing even comparable to it. <laughs> um, so what the major discovery, at least if you ask people who are interested in this type of thing, is what's called the Radius Valley. Uh, and that's the plot I'm showing here, the, the orange kind of uh, bar plot. And what it's showing is um, the result of the entire Kepler mission, so the roughly 4,000 planets that it discovered, if you tally up the distribution and the radii of these planets, so how frequently do you find um, planets of one Earth radius or two Earth radii or three, um, there's, a, there's a really striking feature here, which is that there's two peaks and there's a dip between them. So there's a peak at about maybe 1.4 Earth radii here which is shown by Kepler 452b. Um, and there's a peak at about 2.5 Earth radii um, where it's shown Kepler 222 or 22b. And in between them is a massive valley. There's a huge cliff. There's almost, you just don't find any planets that are like between 1.5 and two Earth radii. Um, and this is really, I mean, that's to me, that's totally not obvious. Like it's amazing that this, this clean of a signal can be found. This means that planets really do have, um, a preferential formation mechanism. It's not just chaos. Um, and what's amazing that this was actually predicted by a group um, before Kepler uh, revealed these results. So it's kind of a prediction that was made from theory, which is very rare, which turns out to be correct, uh, or at least looks correct. And I think it's just amazing that planets in the galaxy seem to have preferred radii. I mean, it's weird, <laughs> just incredible, I think. We, we can now say, I think most, uh, most stars that are sun-like in the galaxy probably have a planet either 1.4 or two Earth radii large or 2.5 Earth radii large. I mean, that's just not obvious. It's weird and strange, but I think it's telling us something really deep about how planets form. And uh, there was a, a press release not too long ago, I think it was towards the end of last year, that astronomers may have detected the first planet 
found in another galaxy. Uh, did you have any info on that or could you com comment on that? I, I'm not an expert, but it's true. Yeah, I mean, so these people, um, they're using um, telescopes that are not designed to find planets, but if you're lucky enough and you're good at data mining, you can find signals of planets in Andromeda, for example. Um, it's not easy to do. I'm not an expert on how they do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's possible. And I think people are, people are interested in that because um, these telescopes, they, you know, they're creating terabytes of data an hour. <laughs> so yeah. there's, there's lots of gold. If you're willing to search for it, there's gold in these data mines. If, you, if you're willing to do the work. Um, yeah, and I guess people are still data mining the Kepler data and are going to be doing that for years to come. So. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Tim. Um, I don't, hold on, let me pull up my, um, my chat here, make sure. Uh, let's see, there was a question. As of right now, how many planets do we suspect are in our own galaxy? Well, I mean, it's a bit of an extrapolation. We can't study the whole galaxy, but we've studied um, our neighborhood. And mm -hmm. it turns out that the numbers are something like one super Earth per FGK star. So at one super Earth per solar kind star. Um, roughly. Uh, it might be slightly less, but it's of order one, one super Earth per, per solar type star. So there's something like a couple hundred billion stars in the galaxy, mm -hmm. probably at least that many planets. Um, and it's also true that M dwarf, so, so the, the low mass end of stars, um, they're more numerous in the galaxy than solar type stars, and they seem to have possibly even more planets than solar type stars, or super Earths at least. Um, so, I mean, there's yeah. absolutely huge number of planets out there. They're literally everywhere. And if uh, memory serves correctly, so Proxima Centauri uh, is, you know, the closest star to our, our sun. It just had its third planet confirmation. Is that correct? It's either two or three. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Yeah. This was, uh, this was recent. That's, that's right, though. Yeah. So even in our immediate vicinity, there's planets that are, um, they're not Earth-like, but they're, somewhat close, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, let's see, from observing a planet microlensing event, can we actually figure out properties of the underlying planet? That is a fantastic question. Um, so so the, shorter answer is, the short answer is somewhat. I mean, you can find the radius and the mass. Well, the radius, you can find the mass for sure. Um, the problem with microlensing is that because we're sort of waiting for random stars to cross our field of vision, you can't follow up. You can't go back with a different telescope and find that planet and then study it in more detail like we can with Kepler. With Kepler, we can find planets and then we know interesting ones to look at with, say, for example, James Webb. You can go and check their atmospheres, for example. But with microlensing, it's chance encounter. So once you've determined the planet's mass and possibly radius and orbital period, um, then it's gone forever. You have no way of finding that planet again after it's been microlensed once. So the short answer is not really, but you do have a great number of planets you can study in aggregate at least. Okay, and our, well, excuse me, uh, can any of the methods uh, hint at anything about the rotation of the detected planets? For example, uh, for any of them being tidally locked or not, or are they too far away for us to be able to, to figure out anything like that? Uh, for close, close in ones, yeah. So, so like you said, tidally locked planets, um, but the difficulty is um, rotation can be hard to decipher um, in an observation. I'm not an observer myself, but there are problems when you, and when you're looking for a transit, for example, you only get so much information about the very top layers of a planet's atmosphere that the starlight passes through. So you don't really get a, a chance to study, um, for example, the, the um, atmospheric dynamics or something like that from rotation. Hot Jupiters are easy to study, Hot Jupiters are giant planets that are extremely close into their central stars, like orbital periods of a day or less. Um, and those can be studied. You can study the winds and the, the rotation period um, for hot Jupiters, but they're much, that's because they're much easier. They're huge. So it's not very difficult to find them and study them. Um, but for smaller planets, rotation is more tricky. Um, but people have been doing really detailed studies of hot Jupiters and their, their, um, their winds as a function of how frequently they spin up and things like that. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and one final question. Uh, if there's a planetary radius valley, is there a distance from the sun valley? That is a great question. Again, these, that's phenomenal. I, people have made similar plots, actually. Um, 
The answer is no, there's, there's not a valley in orbital period, um, but there are some other extremely interesting features like small planets seem to be kind of evenly distributed in orbital period. So if you make a kind of similar plot, most of the bars will have the same height. You'll pretty much find small planets everywhere between orbital periods of a day and a hundred days. But for giant planets, that's absolutely not the case. They have a completely different distribution. Um, they're much less frequently found at orbital periods of a day and more frequently found much further out at 100 days or 300 days. Um, and that's totally not clear why that is. There's a huge dichotomy in their distributions, which of course tells you something interesting about how they form or how they evolve, um, but it hasn't been really figured out yet. Yeah. Huh, and kind of like, yeah there, are, there are theoretical ideas, but um, nothing has been fully proven yet. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Tim. And folks, if you have any other questions that pop in your mind later on, um, just pop them in the chat and we'll try to get to those uh, either in between the upcoming presentations or at the very end. So thank you again, Tim. That was a, a wonderful presentation. Thank you, everybody. All right. And so now we're going to come back into the U.S., right back into Tennessee, and we're going to go just a little bit north of Dyer Observatory and uh, and visit with Theo Wellington. And Theo is going to Talk to us a little bit tonight, uh, if I remember correctly, about spectroscopy. So Theo, please take it away. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about spectroscopy, but in the context of this being, uh, you know, Women's History Month, um, wanting to celebrate a particular woman who did a lot of really good early work in spectroscopy. So... Her name, uh, oh, wait, before that, I want to say, we, we used to do this exercise in the planetarium before one of our shows. The show was named Hubble, and Hubble, of course, was named for a scientist. But we would actually ask, so who can name a scientist? And we would get all these names, and they would never be a single woman named. And so that was kind of interesting. So we, we took that, and, and then we would you know have a little lecture about how ladies do things, too. Um, Women have always played a role in science, even if it was just, you know, supporting roles. But my personal hero when I was very young was Marie Curie for two reasons. Um, I read her biography. She was a fantastic scientist, uh, but she was also Polish, which is my dad's heritage. So I liked that. So she was my personal hero. And, you know, a lot of the ladies early on, they didn't, uh, they just didn't hear the word no, even if it was spoken. They just kept on doing work. And they just kept going in things that were interesting to them, not necessarily saying, I know I'm going to be the first. You just do things because they're fun. So in this talk, let's see if I can start sharing the screen. Let's see. Hopefully this works. It's a new computer, so you never do know. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about Celia Payne Kaposchkin because she used spectroscopy to show literally what the stars are made out of, which is pretty fun. All right, let's see if I can make this thing go forward. There we go. So she was born in 1900, and this was before we actually understood what powered stars in the first place. All we knew is that they were really hot, and our understanding of the exact physical you know, processes and dimensions was kind of limited. Because you know, you can't just walk up to a star and stick a thermometer in it or measure what the pressure is at the surface. So you have to make some guesses. So in the mid 1800s, uh, Joseph Fraunhofer put a prism in front of a telescope. Uh, you remember that Isaac Newton did some work on rainbows seeing that white light was made of all the colors. So he put a prism in front of the uh, telescope and found out that the sun's light, when you broke it up and really spread it out, had all these cute little lines in it. We call them Fraunhofer lines still. And then there were a couple of guys that the names are familiar if you've ever taken a chemistry class, Gustav Kirchhoff, probably not saying that right, and Robert Bunsen. They were playing around with their flame and putting elements in, and they found out that it glowed a specific color, and then later that each element has a specific spectrum. It would give off bright emission lines or absorption lines if there's something, if the element's in front of something else gathering light, and, uh, and that that was unique. And so now you could make sense of all those little lines in the solar spectrum. They were representing the elements 
that the star was made out of. At the same time, there was another huge innovation that was just coming up. Henry Draper was a doctor, but he liked astronomy a lot. And since he had a lot of money, he built a really cool observatory and did a lot of fun science. And he was one of the early adopters of photography, which wasn't that easy back in the day. But he started recording spectra, which was another thing. The Fraunhofer picture was hand drawn, but Henry Draper started using it to permanently record these things. So that was pretty fun too. So about the time that uh, Cecilia Payne was born, photography had just gotten to the point where it was useful for astronomy and people could actually record things for a lot of different stars. Now to be a lady in science was not easy. Um, Cecilia's family actually moved to London so that her brother could get a better education, but it worked for her as well. Uh, she ended up at this particular school. And the fun thing was she was encouraged here by Gustav Holtz, who taught music to the young ladies, because this was, of course, a ladies' school. You went to your own school. And he thought she should go into music. And she, no, I, I really like science. So then she went to Newham College in Cambridge. And she was actually uh, doing courses in a lot of the different sciences. And then she heard a lecture by Arthur Eddington about how much he was learning from his visit to photograph a solar eclipse. A and she was hooked. She said, this is just so amazing. This is where I'm gonna do my work. So she finished her study there, and, but they didn't give her a degree. Why not? Because they didn't give degrees to women. So looking around for what she should do next, um, she said, well, there was a fellowship to encourage women to study at Harvard Observatory. Harvard Observatory kind of has a, a cool place in the history of women in astronomy because they had a group that really encouraged women to come. They had a number of important contributions from women that happened there for that reason. So she talked to Harlow Shapley. She got in. She was doing some work and some studies. And he said, you know what? You need to write these observations up in a thesis. And so she did. And uh, that actually got her the first PhD in astronomy from Radcliffe College, Radcliffe being the ladies' side again of Harvard. All right, so we have the ladies' school. In 1925, she published her thesis. It was called Stellar Atmospheres, a contribution to the observational study of the high temperatures of the reversing layers of stars. That's a long title. Reversing layer was a term used at the time to mean that layer of the sun's atmosphere from whence come these absorption lines. And uh, today we would simply say that's uh, just above the photosphere. The, the continuous color beneath is from the photosphere and the gas just above that absorbs light and makes all those cute little dark lines. All right. So what she mostly did in this thesis was to go over what was just recently learned about what the physics might be at the surface of the sun. It's actually, I'm start, I, I decided to read it because it was actually pretty readable um, and it's online, which is cool. It's about 200 pages, but they're this size, they're short pages. And so far the first 50, she's really just going into this is why I think we can use this pressure for that layer of the atmosphere. This is why we can assume this and this and this. And uh, the end result was kind of fun. She actually found that some of the common metals that are seen in the sun spectrum were present in about kind of the same relative amounts as they are on Earth. But for two elements, she got wildly different answers, hydrogen and helium. Helium wasn't even known on Earth for the longest time. Um, that's why the element is called helium. It was seen first on the sun as a mystery element. And then finally, somebody found some on Earth and said, hey, this is what we're seeing on the sun. So that's kind of interesting. But she determined that hydrogen was huge, that that's most of what the sun was made out of. Well, like the earlier talk, we always start in science to think of what, uh, 
what was, what did we know? And we just say, well, what we know here must be true everywhere. So we looked at the earth. We said the earth is made of these elements in this proportion. Those stars must be made just like that, only hot. So she was really flying in the face of what established science uh, said. And when her uh, thesis was sent out for review, um, Henry Norris Russell, who is the Russell in the Russell Hertzsprung diagram, said, you know, that can't possibly be true. So kind of to not be too much of an outlier there, she added a line that said, well, these are probably spurious results. Then over the next few years, other work uh, came along and said, no, actually she's right. And they had allowed us then to put a list together, you know, the O, B, A, F, G, K, M, which um, those letters didn't start out in that order. But when we understood what was going on here, the temperatures and things with the stars and how that related to their spectra, they got reordered to make sense. So this is what a really good spectrum looks like for each of the kind of bigger bins of the spectral classes. It goes all the way from the O stars, very, very hot stars down to the cool M stars where you start to see bands from things that are not just individual atoms, but actually like here, titanium oxide, and things like that. So that's kind of fun that she was able to do that with, and it was just a new thing that, hey, the rest of the universe isn't actually made of the same stuff as Earth. That's kind of like what we did with the exoplanets that we were just talking about. We thought, okay, we have some inner rocky planets, some outer big planets. Won't all the planet systems look like this? And it turns out they don't. So it's always fun to go there. So today we can get some really cool high resolution spectra. And yeah, this is what Earth's made out of. And I know it's not very readable, but this green is oxygen. This is silicon, lots of other stuff. And there's the sun, hydrogen, helium, and this little sliver of other is where the oxygen and all these other elements are. So very, very different. There's a picture of her later in life. What an amazing story, you know. The sat, her, her career at Harvard, she kept on doing work but even after publishing something that was revolutionary, she couldn't be a professor because guys were professors. But they kept improving her position because she kept doing really good work. So by 1938, she was an astronomer. And in 1956, she got to be the first woman promoted to full professor from within the faculty of Harvard. Later on, she chaired the astronomy department, also being the first woman to head a department at Harvard. So that's just an amazing story. And, uh, you know, we, do, we don't hear enough about some of these ladies. Well, today, spectra look like this. And somebody at a lecture I was attending uh, called it, we said we do the science of squiggly lines now. So we don't look at the colors necessarily, we just have it come out already in intensity versus wavelength, which is okay. But I thought I'd, I'd show you a little bit about what you can do with relatively inexpensive equipment or even just for fun on your own. Um, this is the uh, light from a uh, light downstairs. It's just a regular, uh, call it fluorescent tube light. They have mercury inside them that uh, gives off really specific, let's see if I can get the cursor back over here. Yeah, very bright lines. And then the coating on the outside of the tube kind of re-emits, it absorbs and then re-emits the light so that we see a nice spectrum of, you know, all the colors, because you wouldn't really want to see just really bright emission lines. But you can tell one kind of light bulb from another by its spectra. I actually, uh, one of my kids did a whole science project on that. And I also have a little fun thing. This was what I took the picture with. It's a handheld spectrometer. And you, you just hold it up and you can look at stuff and it shows you across, you know, your eyes field of view, what the spectrum is. It's really a clever, fun device. Saw it at a gear show and had to have it.
But the most fun you can have with this is you can look at sunlight reflected off a white sheet of paper, and you can actually see with your eyes the lines in the solar spectrum. So this was today during a brief accidental moment of sunshine. And uh, I just think that's a pretty cool thing to be able to show students, especially that you can, it doesn't take a lot. It's just got a grating that acts like the prism, breaks up the light into the rainbow, and it's got a slit so that you get a nice sharp view. You're not just letting in all the light. A lot of people have these diffraction grating mounted in a slide. You can actually just put that in front of a camera. You can actually put that in front of your cell phone camera. So again, I had a limited amount of time last night, so I thought, well, I'll try some of this. So that's Betelgeuse, and that's Betelgeuse's spectrum, really overexposed, but it's kind of fun. And this is handheld, so you're going to have to excuse the, the slight blurriness. This is a different star. This is Procyon, Procyon, Alpha Canis Minoris. A little bit different. I was actually able to hold still for most of this one. And they look a lot the same, but even burned in like this, if you put them next to each other, you can start to see some differences. There is a lot of red on the end of Betelgeuse's. A little bit more blue here. Procyon is just a few spectral classes away and not nearly as much red on the end. This is where it froze the last time, too. Okay. So that's where I'm going to stop sharing, I guess. There we go. So I'd like to add a hot O or B star. I'll get around to that one of these days to see how different that is. But it's you can do a lot yourself with just really stuff you have kind of laying around the house. And... Uh, I hope if you're raising a young lady that you do remember that they enjoy science just as much as boys. I worked for a number of years at the Adventure Science Center and I always enjoyed kind of being that role model where I'm presenting science and hey, look, I'm a woman, I can do this too. Because studies have shown that parents, when they go through a science center and stop in front of an exhibit, they actually spend a lot more time if they're with a boy than a girl. We all have unconscious biases. We don't even think about the things we do. So if you have a young lady, I encourage you to encourage her to explore all of her interests because the telescopes and stars are yours to enjoy. So I hope you enjoyed the trip through history and uh, learned a little bit about how we know what everything is actually made out of, thanks to Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin. All right. Thank you very much, Theo, and especially that last part, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, you know, we, we try to promote science to everyone that comes to the observatory and, you know, always try to, um, you know, encourage anybody that it shows any interest in science to pursue that. So thank you very much for that presentation. Um, one question I had that came to mind uh, when you were talking about the little handheld spectrometer, um, and you kind of alluded to this a little bit later on. Should you ever take one of those and just point them up at the sun to take a look at the sun spectrum? No, you should look at a white piece of paper, the side of a building, anything other than the sun, because it's always and always, always, you never look at the sun, it's too bright. The only time you can look at the sun is if you put something that cuts down the light so much that you can look at it, solar glasses, solar filters, specialized telescopes, but never your eyeballs. And uh, yeah, that would not be good. And I think they have some, uh, there's probably some verbiage on the side of the tube about that. There almost has to be, but yeah, do not point it at the sun. Um, we've used some little handheld spectrometers like that before. And one thing we've done to look at the sun spectrum is, you know, if we've got the sun in one part of the sky over here and we've got a, a nice cloud over in the other part of the sky, we'll point it at that cloud and you can actually see the spectrum pretty well. So if you don't have a, hand, a piece of paper handy or something, you know, that, that helps as well. So the, the grading came with a little kit. And I don't know if I can get this where the camera will pick it up. But the, there was a little kit that had cardboard you would fold and, and you had a slit at one end. And then you put the, you know, spectral grading in and you could have a little handheld thing to go around and check out, you know, lights and things, too. Mm -hmm. 
Somebody had those for incredibly cheap once upon a time, and I bought like 50 of them just to have them for outreach. But Yeah, we have a, a collection of them here. And, you know, doing spectroscopy, that's one of the labs that uh, I often do in an intro astronomy class. And that's always my favorite lab because we get to, you know, get the fun little spectrometers. We get to set out the light sources. I don't tell the students what the lights are. And then they try to analyze the spectrum and then I give them, uh, you know, some samples and say, okay, see if you can match them up. So it's always a lot of fun. And I think it's because, you know, I'm, I, I like, you know, pretty shiny objects. So these colorful lights, you know, it always dazzles me. So. Um, we do have a question. Uh, would you mind sharing the objects that show the spectrum of the light? I don't know if you still have the, the slideshow available um, or maybe if you had a link to uh, a, a site online that maybe sold some of those. Um, you know, if you could put that in the chat later. Okay. They're looking for, for. Um, I, I might've been the little handheld spectrometer. That's what okay. I'm guessing. Rainbow Symphony uh, made the, uh, the grading. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, other one was Shell Yak, which is a company mm -hmm. that makes, that's the cheapest thing they make is the cute little handheld guy. They make some really awesome, uh, observing the sun type spectrographs. I was saw one at a uh, astrophotography workshop. They had it out on the patio. You could dial with your hands through the spectrum. I mean, you were only looking at a slice of the solar spectrum and just hundreds of lines. And it was mm -hmm. the coolest thing. Like, Oh yeah, I'd like to see that. Yeah, but that, that's a little more pricey. Okay. Um, and I will point out, like, if you go to Rainbow Symphony or one of the places that makes these diffraction grading glasses, um, I know that that company in particular also makes a lot of the solar eclipse glasses. So I just want to point out that uh, don't accidentally get grading glasses and look up at the sun to try to view an eclipse. So if you can see right through them very easily, those obviously do not point at the sun. So that's just a, a little disclaimer for everybody's safety there. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much, Theo. That was a, a wonderful presentation. And I'll also add that uh, the Dyer Observatory newsletter I, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we've featured uh, six uh, uh, female astronomers uh, in this year's uh, section uh, honoring uh, Women's History Month. And so next year, we're going to have another badge and then year after that, another badge. So I would definitely recommend uh, going and checking it out because I certainly learned a lot about the history as we were uh, going through those. So uh, very, very informative, very inspiring as well. So, all righty. Um, oh, okay. Yes. That's what uh, Lisa was asking. Perfect. All right. Well, I guess it's over to me now. So let me see if I can do a screen share. So I'm going to try to get us a view through a telescope and I'm just going to go ahead and give everybody a Fair warning, it's not gonna be an overwhelming view and I'll tell you why here in just a moment as soon as I get pulled up. And screen share and there we go, all right. So um, actually uh, looks like things are calming down a bit. What you should be seeing, in fact, I'm gonna move the telescope just a bit, which if you saw just before um, I did the screen share, I have the Seifert telescope directly behind me. And it has a camera on the back of it. It's looking out at an object that you can't miss. And that's serious. Now you see this bright star right in the very center of the field of view. I'm going to move my mouse up to a little point, a very faint point of light. It's right there, okay? So everybody see where my mouse is? Remember where my mouse is, I'm gonna pull it away. Everybody see a little faint smudge of light? Hopefully everybody is you know, glued to their, their computer screens or their TVs and are like, yeah, we can see it. Um, that is the target that I wanted to talk a little bit about tonight. So this is the Bright Star Sirius. Um, I would imagine that everybody that is viewing tonight, in fact, most people in the world have seen the star Sirius and may not have realized it because Sirius is the brightest star in our night sky. Um, it is about twice as wide as the sun is um, it's about 10,000 uh, degrees Celsius at its, uh, its surface versus our sun's roughly 6,000 degrees. So it's bigger, it's hotter. Those two things right there make it more luminous than the sun. In fact, it is about 25 times as luminous as our own star. But there are many, many, many stars in our galaxy, even in our local part of the galaxy, that are even more luminous than Sirius. 
But the thing that makes it brighter in our sky is that it is one of the closer stars to us. It's only about uh, 8.9 light years away from us. So that's pretty close. Proxima Centauri, our closest uh, stellar neighbor, which we mentioned uh, during the first talk, that's about 4.2 light years away. So this star is roughly twice the distance. Now in the view that I'm showing, which I'm really surprised at how uh, we're starting to pick out Sirius just a little bit, um, you're going to see what look like spikes on, on that bright star. And then at about the eight o'clock position, we see its faint little companion. Okay, and we're going to talk more about that in just a moment, but I'm going to try to bring up uh, the exposure just a bit to kind of emphasize some uh, some features. Yeah, then we're, we're starting to see a serious B just a little bit there, that little smudge right above my mouse. So Sirius is not a single star in the sky. Uh, it is actually a binary star system. Now in this view, you're gonna notice that Sirius is kind of jumping around and, and every now and then it'll kind of enlarge or shrink or it'll distort. And that is because uh, we have a lot of turbulence in the atmosphere above us. So the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, it doesn't have to deal with any of, of this blurriness. It is above our atmosphere. So it gets these super crisp views of our universe. So as the, the air above us is moving around and we've got these different layers of differing temperatures, which means different densities, as the light travels through those layers, it bounces around every time it goes through a different density layer. And so if the atmosphere is really calm, then we have a much clearer view. And we say that the seeing is very good. Tonight, the seeing, well, actually go back about 30 minutes, I could barely make out Sirius B uh, whatsoever. So the seeing is pretty poor right now. It was much poorer earlier, but um, it looks like it is improving. One other feature that you're going to notice about this view is that there are these spikes, and you can even see a little bit of coloration on those spikes. Those are known as diffraction spikes, and we get those with a telescope like the Seifert telescope behind me, because part of it, its secondary mirror, is actually supported by four supports. And as light passes by those supports, it bends ever so slightly. Okay, it's, a, it's an effect called diffraction. And so that causes, so those, those supports actually kind of focus light just a little bit and create those spikes. They're, they're pretty, but if you're trying to do science, especially trying to learn the luminosity of a star, they're kind of a headache because if you're measuring the, 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 the brightness of a star, which I think our, our, one of our presenters, uh, John, might be talking a little bit about tonight, you have to take into account uh, that, uh, that amount of light as well. So, um, but anyway, I wanted to give you a live view. It's always fun to have a little bit of a live view through the telescope. So now let me stop my screen share and do a, another screen share. Uh, let me find my, well, actually, let me yeah, stop here and close all of these windows. I can actually see what I'm doing. Give me one second, start the, the PowerPoint, which only has a couple of slides. Sent, start. Okay, now let me get back to screen sharing and. All right, so hopefully now you're able to see a little drawing of the constellation of Orion. Okay, so Orion is an easy target to see this time of year. It's easily found by the famous three belt stars uh, that make a really nice line. Uh, they point down towards uh, the bright star Sirius, again, the brightest star in the night sky. And um, they actually point up to another star cluster, which I believe Adam's going to be talking about here momentarily, called the Pleiades. But Sirius is easy to find because um, it's bright and it's got some stars to, to point right to us. So what if we had a really good calm night? What will we see through the telescope? So this was a view that I took, oh, it was about a month ago, if I remember correctly. Um, this is Sirius and, uh, well, more specifically, it is Sirius A, which is the brightest of the two stars, one that has the really bright spikes on it. And then 
Uh, here I flipped the view to where we would see it actually, it actually is on the sky. We see little Sirius B right there. And that is a companion to Sirius A. The A designation is given to the brighter of the stars in a system, and then the B is going to the dimmer one. So if we had three stars here, the brightest would be A, the dimmest would be C, and then the one that's kind of in between would be B, okay? So here's a little label. So Sirius is often referred to as the dog star. It is the brightest star in the constellation Canis Major. Um, so when you're looking at it, um, with your with your bare eye and you see it blazing away up there, you're really seeing mostly just the light from Sirius A, okay? Um, Sirius B, uh, because it's much smaller and dimmer than, than Sirius A, the dog star, it's often referred to as the pup. So, um, but let's talk a little bit about the pup. So what is it? Well, it's really not a star anymore because to be a star, you have to be producing your own energy and that's, that's through fusion processes. So our sun is a star because right now it's fusing about 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium every second that produces energy that comes out as visible light, as heat, uh, even as x-rays and things like that. Sirius B is the core of a dead star. It is, it's still white hot. It's actually about 25,000 degrees Celsius compared to Sirius A's 10,000. But it is, a, it is the core of a star that was orbiting with Sirius A that has since died, okay? And so this core is just in the process of radiating away its energy, radiating away that heat and gradually cooling off. And it takes literally billions of years for these, uh, these kinds of objects called white dwarfs to, uh, to cool off completely. And as they get cooler, they'll get fainter, okay? So as you can see, Sirius B, the pup, is not much bigger than the Earth. I mean, it's right around the same diameter as our planet, which is about 110 times smaller in diameter than our sun. However, Sirius B actually has a little bit more mass, about 2% more mass than our sun. So even though it's the size of our Earth, it has the same mass as about 335,000 Earths, all compressed down into this ball. So an extremely dense object. Uh, it's not the densest kind of object. Those are the, their cousins, the neutron stars. But um, the common uh, description for a white dwarf is if you took a, a teaspoon to one of these white dwarfs and you dug out a, a teaspoonful of, of its mass and brought it back to the Earth, on the Earth's gravity, a typical white dwarf a teaspoon of material would weigh about five tons. Now that's with an average density white dwarf, which is about half the mass of the sun and roughly the same volume. But this white dwarf is on the heavier end. It's about twice the density of a normal white dwarf. So this one, a teaspoon of, of, of it on the earth would weigh about as much as a full grown, actually two full grown African elephants. So very, very dense material. It's mostly carbon. That's the leftover uh, material from uh, the star when it fused helium in, into carbon in its core in the last stages of its life. Here are two views of Sirius, um, to see Sirius A and Sirius B. Um, the left side view, that blue view, that is uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see Sirius A blazing away as normal. And then down at about the seven o'clock position, you'll see Sirius B. The right side image, this is an X-ray view from the Chandra X-ray Observatory. The brighter star in there, these are still oriented the same way, the brighter star in the X-ray view is actually the pup. It is, because it is much hotter than, uh, than its partner, uh, the dog star, Sirius A, um, it produces more X-rays than Sirius A does. So in visible light, Sirius A takes the cake. I mean, it is by far many, many, many times brighter than Sirius B. But in X-rays, Sirius uh, B, the pup, is the winner here. Okay. Now, white dwarves, we can see other examples of white dwarves. Um, so as a, a small star, and when I say small, I mean less than about eight times the mass of the sun, which comprises you know, about, I think it's something like 90 to 95% of the stars in the universe. 
When those stars begin running out of fuel in their cores, the cores begin to shrink down into gravity and heat up. That causes the outer layers to expand outwards and the star becomes a red giant. Um, in the very last stages of a star's life, uh, you know, go forward about 5 billion years from now to what our sun will be doing, its outer layers will be puffed up. And once they get really puffed up, they get, they're, they're really far away from most of the mass of the star, which is still concentrated around the core, which means that gravity is very weakly holding those layers. So it doesn't take much for um, you know, maybe a big convective cell to push off some of this gas into space. So over a period of a few thousand years, a small star will begin shedding its layers into space and it creates something called a planetary nebula. These are two examples, uh, both from the Hubble Space Telescope. The one on the left, which I hope we're gonna view next month uh, with the Seaford Telescope is called the Clown Face Nebula. The one on the right is called the Cat's Eye Nebula. And you can actually see both of these with a small backyard telescope. You just won't see quite the detail you see here. Um, but you see right at the very center of these images, these little bright spots, those are the white dwarves, the cores of those dead stars. Now it looks like those cores are, are pretty big compared to the nebula, okay? But in, in reality, when light goes through a telescope, it spreads out a bit. So um, the star looks like it has a physical size in the images here, but in fact, uh, in real life, they, uh, they would cover less than a single pixel in the image, okay? So these nebulae are a couple of light years wide. They're still gradually expanding outwards. And because their cores, those white dwarves are so hot, they produce a tremendous amount of ultraviolet light, which goes out into that nebula and lights it up like a big neon sign, okay? In fact, if you put a spectrometer on a telescope and, uh, and sample the light coming from these nebulae, you'll see bright lines, uh, typically from hydrogen and from oxygen. So um, if you ever get a chance to look at the cat's eye nebula, this one, the white dwarf is bright enough. I've actually seen that white dwarf in the telescope. They're not easy to spot in these nebulae. They're often still very, very faint, even with a big telescope like the Seifert telescope. But that's one where I have actually seen that white door. So how does this relate to uh, what we see with Sirius and, uh, and its two components? Well, the white dwarf is the core of a star that was actually bigger in mass than Sirius A. Now, the thing about stars is the, um, their, their lifetimes depends on how much fuel they have and how they burn that fuel or how they go through that fuel. So you would think that a much bigger star, having a much bigger fuel supply would last the longest, but in fact, it's the exact opposite. Because bigger stars um, have much higher core temperatures, they fuse that fuel at a much higher rate. And so the most massive stars have the shortest lifetimes. The little red dwarf stars like Proxima Centauri, they have the longest lifetimes. So Sirius B, the pup, actually started out as a star. It's thought to be about five times the mass of our sun. And so um, both it and, um, and, and uh, what we now call Sirius A formed together. They were orbiting around one another uh, for uh, many, many years. Um, and then Sirius, uh, Sirius B, uh, the, the more heavy or the heavier of those two stars at the time began to evolve. And eventually it swelled up to become a red giant and it started spilling mass over onto Sirius A. So this is, if we went back in time, I think it was about 120 million years ago, it's estimated, and looked at this star system, this is what we would have seen. We wouldn't have seen it quite this well in a telescope, but if you were in orbit with these stars this is what you would have seen. Um, so this would have been Sirius B swelling up and um, it's starting to spill material over onto its companion. And these outer layers are, are not only spilled over onto the companion, but they're ejected off into space until eventually we get just a white dwarf left behind. And now Sirius A, which is the brighter of the two stars now, it has a little bit more mass than it started out with. And in fact, um, uh, its, its companion may have enriched it in some of the heavier elements that it processed. So we saw this diagram earlier. Um, these two stars, they orbit a common center of mass, just like a planet going around a star. 
Um, and in fact, Sirius B was discovered first uh, through observing the motion of Sirius A. It was noted that Sirius A didn't have a, a consistent motion ac uh, across the sky. Um, every year, the star would move just a tiny, tiny bit among the background stars, but it, it wasn't quite what we expected. It wasn't like a nice linear fashion. It was like it was being tugged. So it was thought it might have a companion. And then about 1861, um, uh, it was a, I think it was an 18 inch telescope picked up Sirius B uh, for the first time. So um, in that time, we've been able to observe these stars orbiting. They take about 50 years to orbit a common center of mass. Um, in 2019, the two stars just passed a point called apoapsis, okay, which is the fancy term for saying, okay, they're not in perfectly circular orbits around one another, so they vary their distance. They were actually at their farthest from one another, which if you've got a really bright star like Sirius A, and its little companion gets really far away, that makes it easier to see, okay? So right around now is the time that we're able to see Sirius B in a, a telescope, and it's actually outside of the glare of its bright companion. Now you would think, well, it's now 2022, it's getting closer to Sirius B or to, to Sirius A, so it should be getting harder and harder to see. But in fact, um, it will actually appear to be its farthest from Sirius A in 2023 because their orbits are not face on to us. So it's just a projection effect. So uh, in this diagram here, if we were looking at the orbits from above, this is how Sirius B would appear to orbit around uh, Sirius A, which they're actually both orbiting, but uh, if we held one still, this is what we would kind of see. So 2019, there's where they're actually their farthest. But over here, this, this, uh, ellipse here, this is showing the projected view that we have of Sirius, um, of Sirius B going around Sirius A. And so here's where it was actually at apoapsis, it's farthest point from, from Sirius A. But from our viewpoint, it looks like it'll actually get just a tiny bit farther away when it's down here in 2023. But then after that, it'll start appear to draw closer and closer to Sirius A. Um, and then it'll be very difficult to pick it out of the glare of, of um, its bright companion, especially with a smaller telescope. So anyway, if you get a chance and you have a good clear night and there are websites that'll tell you what the seeing conditions are supposed to be for your area, you might pop in uh, a decent magnification eyepiece and see if you could spot uh, the, the pup around the dog star. So um, if you don't get a, a chance to do it in the next few years, Give it another 50 years or so, you'll get another chance. So. And with that, I think I'm gonna stop my share because I'm probably over time because I cannot see my clock with the, uh, the full screen there, but uh, let me exit out of that. And let's see, um, see if there are any questions. It doesn't look like there's any questions at the moment, but some folks might have some in a little bit. So without further ado, uh, let's just keep on going through and we're going to now go over to, uh, let's see who's next. We're gonna go over to East Tennessee, over to Kingsport, to Adam Thans with the Bayes Mountain Park and Planetarium. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about uh, some catalogs and, and also about the, the, uh, the Pleiades star cluster. So Adam, please take it away. Thank you, Billy. Um, yes, we're gonna be uh, learning a little bit about what's up in the current night sky. Um, Okay, right now the video is still on Billy. Sorry, it's just a little technical thing. Brian. <laughs> okay, well, you're looking at Billy, but you're hearing me. Um, so, um, yeah, so what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be learning about uh, the Pleiades star cluster. You have probably seen this in the night sky and maybe didn't even realize that it was a star cluster. Uh, maybe you thought it was a constellation. I hear, um, not all the time, but every once in a while in the planetarium uh, at Bayes Mountain, um, that's the Little Dipper. Well, it looks like the Little Dipper, but it's, uh, let's see, it's on, okay. So um, it looks like the Little Dipper, uh, but it's actually not. It is a true cluster of stars. 
And um, what I'm going to do, I'm actually not going to share my screen. I'm using OBS. So the, the view that you see of me right now is what will be uh, broadcast. And um, this is the first picture that I, okay, there we go. Um, so this is the first picture that I have for you. There's something a little different in this view. I don't know if you can notice it. I'm going to give you a moment. Always the educator. Okay, so this is the Pleiades star cluster, but there's an interloper, the planet Venus. This was uh, taken a little while ago, uh, I think about two years ago. And um, there are times in which a planet will be seen in front of a cluster of stars or uh, some other famous stars. And this time it was very close to where we would see uh, the Pleiades star cluster. And so Venus looks really bright. And I was thinking about this, so about when uh, Billy was talking and in all the pictures of Sirius A and Sirius B, it just, it makes it look like if you traveled there, all, you know, Sirius A would be ginormous and yes, it would be larger than Sirius B, but it's the photograph that deceives you because if you had like perfect vision in which you could see all the stars, but without the photographic bloating, all the stars would be pinpoints. Just like when you look at the real night sky and you see really bright stars and you see really faint stars, they all look like pinpoints and they do also in a telescope. It's only the photograph that keeps building that light and it starts spreading out onto the sensor. And in this case, Venus is doing the same thing. It's overexposed. And so it's just looking like it's enormous, but really it would have just looked like, you know, a little planet amongst the, the other stars all about the same size. So it is deceiving, so you have to realize that. But the other bright stars are the Pleiades. Now the Pleiades is a very young cluster and it's made of very hot stars. Have you noticed the color of the stars? Now, Theo had a great talk about uh, stars, star types, the colors of stars, the spectra of stars. Um, stars can be of all kinds of colors, not green, sorry, but they can be anywhere from blue to just white. And then you get a little cooler to like yellow, like our sun, and then cooler yet to orange and then red. So you have all these colors, red stars, generally mean, in a telescope, generally mean the very small, tiny stars, very cool in temperature and very small. Blue-white stars are your big monster hot stars like Sirius. And so the Pleiades is made of very hot, bright stars. And, um, and so you can see that in the picture. You don't see reddish or orange or even yellow. Uh, there is a blue hue to this. This is a single exposure, by the way. I don't like doing stacking or using CCD cameras. I did my research on that a zillion years ago in grad school. Um, it, it's, it takes forever. I, I prefer to get that one nice shot and then I enjoy it. So this is a single shot and it's really hard to balance the, the brightness of Venus compared to the cluster. This next picture I took without Venus. It's not the best one out there. Uh, I have seen some really great ones, but it's a single exposure and it's showing some things. One, you see the blue white hot stars. You also see this nebulosity around the stars. It was thought long ago that this, that this was the nebula in which the stars formed. Well, it was realized about 25 years ago, I think, that no, these stars are traveling through this nebulous region that is part of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And the Pleiades star cluster is in our galaxy too. And it's just kind of, it's like traveling through a foggy area when you drive to work in the early morning and you go down in that 
you know, like a little valley space and all of a sudden you're driving through this fog and then you drive out and it all clears out. It's kind of the same thing. Um, and so that's what all that nebulosity is. Also, if you think about the physics, can't be because hot blue white stars, they are dumping energy out into space and any nebulosity that might have been around that star is going to get blown away. It's just going to get, you know, pushed out. And these are not like just formed stars. These are fully, you know, formed uh, blue white stars. So it is really cool to uh, see this nebulosity in larger telescopes. You can actually just see it looking through a telescope, just barely, but you get the hint of that nebulosity, that fuzziness, and that's pretty cool. Um, and so they're in the same area of space. You can even see around the cluster, and of course I'm talking about the stars that are bloated with the longer exposure and kind of in the middle of the image, but you also see kind of this general glow in the background. It's not black like it is on the far right. Um, that That is also part of that nebulosity. Uh, and so um, really neat to see. And it's also very easy to see. How easy? We're going to find out where to look. This is uh, the part of the sky towards the west-southwest for tonight at 9 p.m. So uh, I know it, and that's nine, so your local nine o'clock time. So I guess for a lot of you, that's about now. And if you look to that direction, you're going to see what Billy talked about, which is the famous constellation of Orion. Um, you see the three belt stars going across there from the kind of the top center. And then hanging from the belt, but it's sideways, is the nebulous region, the Orion Nebula. You can see that with your eyes. If it's a dark sky, uh, binoculars are also a great way to view the night sky. And then, of course, if you follow the belt stars to the left, right on the edge of the uh, drawing that I've got here, you see Sirius right near the edge. It's like right above my head on this view. Well, follow the belt stars the other way. Go to the right. And you see the V-shape of Taurus the bull. It's like this. And the nose is at the point. The two eyes are at the end of the V. If you continue with the belt stars and go through the face of Taurus the bull, then you will find the Pleiades star cluster you can see at the end of that line. It's part of Taurus the bull. <clears throat> and you can see it, that it looks like a little dipper. But of course, it's the Pleiades star cluster. So with your eye, you can see the cluster clearly. Binoculars are actually a great way to see it or a spotting scope or really anything you've got. Um, you don't have to have a fancy telescope to see it. A uh, telescope will show more stars. And um, right there, I've got it circled, is the Pleiades. Now the Pleiades is, again, a very young cluster. Let's compare it to an old cluster that's right in front of you and you probably didn't know. The face of Taurus the bull, but not including, <clears throat> excuse me, not including Aldebaran, which is the reddish star, which is the left of the two eyes, as you see the V shape. So that reddish star, Aldebaran, is actually only about 60 light years away, which means it takes light 60 years to travel from it to us. So we see it not as it is now, but as it was 60 years ago. <clears throat> Let's see, it's 19, uh, 20, 2022. So that means 1962 um, is when the light from Aldebaran left that star and now we finally see it. So we see the light of 1962 from Aldebaran, so to speak, um, right there. The V shape of the face of Taurus though, that's about 150 light years away. <clears throat> so much farther. And uh, it's called the Hyades. I'll spell that H-Y-A. 
DES. So the Hyades is a very old cluster. I do not have a photo to show you right here, but when you, this is, you have homework now. I'm, as an educator, can't you know do my job unless you have some homework. So your homework assignment is uh, possibly tomorrow when I hope it will clear up or the next day. It should clear up within the next few days. Go outside, find the face of Taurus the ball. If you have binoculars, use them. Notice that you're gonna see a lot of fainter stars all sprinkled throughout that area. And you're gonna notice that there is a kind of a reddish hue amongst many of those stars. They won't look blue white like the Pleiades star cluster. And so the other half of your assignment uh, boys and girls, is to look at the Pleiades as well. Uh, so use either just your eyes or use a pair of binoculars or a telescope and compare the two clusters. Also notice something else. You can visually see it, though distance can be a factor. The Hyades star cluster is 150 light years away. The Pleiades is about 400 light years away. Yes, about two and a half times farther away, but notice that it's much more compact. And there's a reason. As a star cluster ages, the stars slowly drift apart from each other. And so another clue that the Hyades is a much older cl cluster is that they are farther apart. These are all within our own galaxy. They are found typically along the spiral arms of um, of our galaxy or nearby, but these are very close by clusters of stars. There are other clusters as well. And um, so um, and please try to look at that. And then, well, where do clusters come from? Nebulous regions. So can you remember, I, I talked about a nebulous region just a few moments ago. Okay, I think I hear it out there. Yes, the Orion Nebula, the belt, I'm sorry, just under the belt of Orion and the sword of Orion. Use the binoculars and you're gonna find where star, where a type of place in which star clusters are formed. The Orion Nebula will eventually become about 20,000 stars. So star clusters can be anywhere from just a few hundred stars to uh, a, a few, you know, a number of thousands of stars. And what we're not going to talk about tonight, but we have at other times, are globular clusters, which are very different creatures. And they're like 100,000 to a million stars, very different things. Uh, oh, there's the Orion Nebula. I forgot about that. Now, Billy mentioned about catalogs. And so I'm going to segue into the interesting thing about the Pleiades star cluster. So if you aren't sure how to spell it, there it is, P-L-E-I-A-D-E-S. And the Pleiades is kind of the official name. It is very well known throughout history. There, It's been mentioned clearly in the um, um, by Omar Khayyam and many other authors and poets, and it goes on and on. But I don't know if you realize that there are actually a lot of names for the Pleiades. Let's look. There's another name, the Seven Sisters. You can see why. If you have very good eyes, you'll see five or six stars with just your eyes looking at the cluster. If you really have good eyes, you'll see the seventh star. That one is really hard to see. You have to have good eyes to see the seventh. Binoculars, though, will show dozens. And so you'll be able to see more than just the seven sisters. But that's the common name that's easy to remember. The Pleiades is a little harder to remember. But wait, there's more. Familiar? Car company. Think of that, uh, that picture and think of the emblem for the Subaru, uh, for, for the Subaru car. It is the Pleiades star cluster. That's just Subaru is Japanese for the Pleiades. So you didn't know you were gonna be learning some Japanese today.
How about M45? Well, M45 is the list that, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, Charles Mezier made back in the 18th century. So he made this list uh, that was his, um, not a comet list. We've talked about this in the past uh, with our viewings, but the these are about 100, it's actually 110, but the list that Messier actually made was about 100 or so objects that he was looking for, that when he was looking for comets, he said, could that be a comet? And then, nope, it's not a comet. And so he put it on his list. Well, they tend to be 110 best and easiest things to see in the Northern Hemisphere sky. And uh, he made this between 1774 and 1784. So uh, he was a French astronomer. And um, so they're listed M and then a number. This is the 45th on his list. And uh, what's interesting, when you look at them in the sky, like if you could see a map of the whole sky, uh, like a chart, you'd see how the numbers kind of progress across the sky. And then there's some interlopers because over the years that things would kind of skip around. How about NGC 1432? It's exciting, isn't it? So um, it may not be my favorite number, but it is the new general catalog number for the Pleiades. So there's lots of these catalogs out there. In science, of course, you got to have your data. Can't do without. And these different catalogs were designed for different purposes. So Messier's was just kind of like a greatest hits kind of list. The new general catalog was an actual scientific listing of, of nebulae and clusters of stars uh, compiled by John Louis Emile Dreyer uh, back in 1888 and 7,840 objects. This was more of a scientific survey of the night sky of things that were not just stars, like just a star. So clusters of stars, galaxies, nebulae, uh, globular clusters, et cetera, dark nebulae. These were all listed in this catalog. And so it was a way of trying to find out what's out there. You know, it's more than just stars. How about CR42? 42? 42 is a very important number if you know your uh, Douglas Adams. But uh, CR42 is the colander catalog. And it's 471 open clusters. And this catalog was made by Swedish astronomer Per Colander uh, back in 1931. So you can make up your own catalog if you want and name it. And it's just as legitimate as any other catalog. But some catalogs tend to be uh, made to then focus on uh, a certain aspect or characteristic. We have one more though I'm sure it's not the end of the list, but one more for tonight, MEL-22. So this is from the Malat catalog of 245 star clusters by British astronomer, Philibert Jacques Malat back in 1915. So you will see these unusual catalog listings if you start getting into astronomy. Uh, you might see them on star charts. Typically, you see them uh, through um, computerized uh, star, uh, star charting software. Like it shows the night sky, and you click on an object that's going to list all these different catalogs of the same thing. That's just how it is. Um, but um, the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters, is the way to go. Um, to remember them. And of course, the Pleiades is probably the most romantic of all the names, like, or maybe the Seven Sisters too. Um, but uh, I'm gonna stop here and see if there's any questions. Thank you, Adam. I don't think we have any questions oh. at the moment, but Sorry. there is something. Hang on one sec. Oh. This happened before. My speaker turns off if, I, if oh. it's not being used. Okay. All right, can you hear me now? Nothing? I hear you now. Okay, perfect. Uh, I was saying thank you very much. That was a, a really interesting talk. And you know, when you were 
first showing the image of Venus with the Pleiades that spurred something that I hadn't really realized um, until like a year or two ago when I, I uh, heard something about it. But um, because of our orbital resonance with Venus, so every for every eight years we go around the sun, Venus makes uh, 13 orbits around the sun. So we have an eight to 13 resonance. Um, so every eight years, pretty much exact, uh, Venus will be in the same spot. So I, I looked it up and on Stellarium, it was, I think it was April 3rd of 2020 when it, when Venus was right in front of the Pleiades, you go forward to April 3rd, 2028, Venus is right back in front of the Pleiades eight years after that, right back in front of it. So I always thought that was a really interesting, uh, uh feature there just of orbital dynamics. So. Yeah. It's always a lot of fun. Yeah. Those neat connections and relationships. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yes. It doesn't look like we have any questions at the moment, but folks might be still formulating some. So while they're doing uh, that, we're going to go ahead and, okay. and head out of Tennessee and head up to, uh, to the university of Illinois with Dr. John Martin. And he actually has some clear skies as well. So he's gonna show us one of the little jewels up in the, the early springtime sky. Yeah, why don't I go ahead while I'm introducing myself and here I, yeah, we, we locked out actually tonight. Um, you can see I am also dressed for cold because I'm a little further north. Welcome from the great north here. <laughs> uh, so I'm sharing with you right now, basically the little camera I have on the roof of our observatory here out in the middle of central Illinois, we're a uh, pretty dark sky on the world scale of four. And you can see it, that it's cleared off. Um, I mean, I'll just quickly point out a few things that other people have been talking about. You know, Dr. Billy was talking about Sirius down here. You can see Orion. So, so the bottom here is the south, the top is north, and middle is straight up. So over here in the western part of the sky, you can see Orion. And if you follow Orion's belt, you can come down to Sirius, which Dr. Billy was talking about. If we go the other direction, we can go to Aldebaran and the Hades, what that Chatham was talking about. And just a little further on, you see that smudge right there? The smudge right there is the Seven Sisters or the Pleiades. Now, we got a pretty dark sky out here. We're about four on the Bordel scale. So you can actually see the Milky Way running through here right there. And up in the north, you got the Big Dipper as well. So actually, why don't I do this is zooming in on what we're looking at. So I'm sitting here in the 20-inch telescope dome here. And um, we have a 20-inch telescope pointed at the star cluster M35. Well, actually, a small one next to it. But I'll get to that in a second. And M35 is an open star cluster, like the ones Adam was talking about, in the foot of Gemini. Now, you can see here, these two stars right here are the stars Castor and Pollux. They are in the head of Gemini. You see that if you draw a line from Rigel through the center of the belt of Orion, through Betelgeuse and on up, you get into Gemini here. And Gemini is kind of two strings of stars that come off Castor and Pollux going down this way. Come down this side of the string, you see we come to the feet, we jump out, and you might be able to see a little faint blobby there. But that faint blob there, if you take a look at it with a pair of binoculars, you'll notice that it's not a star, that it's actually a star cluster about the size of the full moon. I'm gonna switch over here to our wide field camera because I have a wide field camera running on the back of our telescope that has a field of view about one and a half degrees by one degree. Here we go. So looking at that little blobby, what do you see? You see star cluster M35. That's actually the size of the full moon. So we can't really fit it in our 20 inch telescope actually. Now M35 is a really interesting star cluster. It's, um, let me get my facts straight here. It's about, um, it's about 3000 light years away from us. And it is somewhere around 175 million years old. So it's pretty young as star clusters go. That's why we see all the blue stars in it. Can you guys notice this other one next to it right here? There's another star cluster in this picture. It's like it's photobombing M35 here. That star cluster right there is NGC 2158. 
It's about 9,000 light years farther away than M35. And it's about, well, it's about 2 billion years old. So about half the age of the sun. This is a really neat view you get with this because you see the hot young nearby star cluster that has lots of blue stars in it. And then the 2 billion light year, the two, I'm sorry, the 2 billion year old star cluster 9,000 light years behind it is kind of more yellowish and reddish, right? And that's because in this older star cluster, the hotter, more massive stars have gone through their lifetime and died. We're left with more of the stars like the sun or a little more massive of the sun as the brightest, biggest stars in this star cluster 9,000 light years behind M35. And that's why it looks more yellowish, more reddish, and less blue hot young stars. Hope you guys enjoyed that really here. I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna show you guys also here, we've been accumulating on this for a while. And people sometimes like to see that what does one image look like? So we take a series, I'm sorry, Adam, we're stacking images. But I take a series of one minute images and stack them together. And I can show you guys, this is what we get with one minute. And I've been sitting here stacking them over the course of kind of the whole star party. We cleared off about half an hour after we started and I've been stacking that time. And you can see how things have filled in between the single image we have and all the images we've stacked together. You get to see a lot more stars when you do stacking like that. Yeah. I wanna show you guys just one more thing here with this too. So I have, you notice that star cluster NGC 2158 is more centered in the field of view on the wide field here. The reason for that is I've centered it up in the field of view on our main telescope. So what does that look like through the 20 inch telescope? Let's try that out. Let me switch my screen so that I can show you there. Let's see, I need to stop, I think. Oh, you share. Now, the camera on the 20 inch telescope is not a color camera. It's one we use for science, actually. So we take the picture through filters and we'll normally combine like a green image with a blue image with a red image to make a color picture. We haven't done that quite here. We just have the black and white image and so that we can see all the stars in NGC 2158, I've taken and done the clear filter, basically letting all the light through. Now the field of view, the difference in field of view here is that wide field of view was about one degree high, about one and a half degrees across. This field of view is about one third of a degree on a side square. So we can see zooming in on the star cluster, but there are a lot of all, there are a lot of stars there. <laughs> As I tell people when we're looking through the telescope, you know, start counting to enjoy and figure out how many there are if you want to know. There are a lot. As we said, that star cluster is about 9,000 light years behind M35, which puts it about 10,000 light years away from us. That's a good ways across our galaxy. Well, so that's what I wanted to share tonight. And I'm happy to put back up any of these for people to see more. But have we got any questions at this point? Yes, it looks like uh, our main question is, can you explain stacking a little? Okay, so the software does this. I I'm using a piece of software. So we have the camera we're using, just so people know, is an ASI 178MC, okay? It's one of these ZWO CMOS cameras that does the color images. And the software that comes with it is able to add together pictures you take in series. And it's smart enough, the software we're using is smart enough that it kind of finds the patterns of the stars in the image and takes and matches them up with each other. Let me switch over to that so that you can see it here. So when we're stacking, we're basically just taking a series of images all together and this piece of software in a live manner, while well, we're live here, stacks them up live in sequence. And so we've stacked here 56 one minute images. So this is 56 one minute images stacked together that you're seeing here versus just one. The stacking, you can see, you see a lot more detail because you're adding it up. It's almost like doing a 56 minute exposure, but it's not quite the same thing.
Uh, any other questions or am I frozen up? <laughs> nope, nope, you're good there. I didn't, didn't know if you had finished or It is not. freezing I, in the dome, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've got a, a little bit of a breeze going through and I've got my hoodie on. So yeah, I'm, I'm feeling the temperature. It's not cold as, as it is up there right now, but I'm yeah, I'm feeling the, the cool spring night. But um, one thing I was going to, to add uh, to what uh, Dr. Martin said was that um, you notice in the, the single image, it looks like everything it's kind of like the image has a little bit more static in it, if you will. So as you continually take those individual exposures and add them together, your, your image, the, the bright, like the stars in there, they start to get a little bit brighter, but that, that static, you would think, well, it's going to continually get it brighter as well. But the static is what we call noise in the image. And that noise, it doesn't actually add the same way that the, the actual signal does. So as you keep adding these images, if you have your noise level gradually getting up, your, your signal, your actual image that you're trying to get is actually adding up much, much faster. So you end up getting a lot more of those details. You, you don't see as, the image doesn't look as grainy anymore. And you know some of these, some of these really spectacular images that you see online, especially from like uh, amateur telescopes, they can literally be days of ex of exposure total. So, um, you know, some of these you may think, oh, that's just a, some, they took a camera out and stuck it on a, a telescope, took an image, and they were done. No, some of these literally took, um, you know, uh, when you add up all the exposure time, was literally days of exposure at the telescope. So, and also add that. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry go ahead. <laughs> no, we're basically just limited by the sky brightness, right? And out here, we can easily get down to seeing 20 main, 20th magnitude stars. Our sky is bright enough or, or dark enough. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can get down okay. to that by stacking. And I was also going to mention that uh, Dr. Martin has a gallery on their website. Maybe you can pop that in, in the chat. I, I will What's definitely that? do that. And I'll put, yeah. I'll put everything we're taking tonight on our social media. I'll try to also get up a movie of, of the clouds going over and it clearing off from our sky cam too. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that sounds like, uh, that sounds great. Um, let's see, I think we do have another question. Are young clusters typically closer to us? No, actually, so it just happens in this case that the younger one is closer by. Um, but basically, but star clusters are spread at all distances. You know, basically what a star cluster is, is when stars form, well, it's more common for them to form in groups. And so most stars form in a star cluster in the cloud they formed in. Now, over time, those star clusters will normally interact with other things as they go through the galaxy and the stars will get peeled off and kind of evaporate away over time. It's rare to find older star clusters like we see with NGC 2158 here, um, but there's no real you know, rule about that younger ones are closer and older ones are far away because they're kind of spread throughout the disk of the galaxy. So we have older ones nearby like the Hyades or we have younger ones nearby like M35 or the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades. And I was also gonna add, if you look at one of these really beautiful images of a face on spiral galaxy, especially like one of the images from the Hubble Space Telescope, um, a lot of these galaxies in their spiral arms will have, um, it kind of looks like fuzzy blue dots, mm -hmm. but each of those are, are clusters uh, like, uh, like the Pleiades. Some of them are very massive clusters, but you'll see that they're, they're kind of just scattered all throughout the disk of the galaxy where you find uh, that gas and that dust form those star clusters. So, mm -hmm. um, but, and, and I know that you had alluded to um, uh, open, or not open, but uh, globular clusters as well. Those, kind of like you, them, yeah. yeah, like like you had said, those are a bit of a different animal. We really don't find those in the disk of the galaxy. We find those more around uh, our galaxy. Yeah, so, so I, guess, the, I guess in that respect, those older ones tend to be farther away, but that's a different animal, as you said. Right, right, yeah. All right, I think that that, that covers it for now, uh, but we might have some more questions pop up. So last but not least, we're going to go over, we've been to, to Middle Tennessee, to East Tennessee. Now we're going over to West Tennessee and visit with Jeremy Veldman, who's actually going to go much farther out into the universe and, and give us a little bit of a tour there. So Jeremy, please take it away. Well, thanks a lot, Billy. It's been another great and uh, highly informative program. And uh, yeah, to wrap up here, 
we've talked a lot about star clusters in the talk tonight. I'm actually going to go and give you a brief look at a galaxy cluster that is prominent this time of year. And uh, spring is galaxy season. So if you're into the faint fuzzies and really stretching your mind as far as what you can see out in the, in the observable universe, certainly from your backyard, then uh, here's a challenge for you. This is something I've been working on for a while. And uh, it's, it's, it's one that not only stretches your thinking, but uh, can also stretch your, um, your, your skills, if you will, as a, as a backyard amateur. So, and I'm working on this. This is a talk I'm actually going to be given next week for the Memphis Astronomical Society. So navigating the Virgo cluster of galaxies, and I'll just show it to you here. Um, this is a snapshot of a portion of the Virgo cluster and I'll explain what each one of these are. But you saw star clusters uh, earlier. Each one of these faint fuzzies here is actually a separate island universe like our Milky Way, consisting of hundreds of billions, if not trillions of stars like our sun. And it just kind of blows my mind how large galaxies are like our Milky Way. If you took the sun and scaled it down in size to the period at the end of a sentence that you read in a book, our Milky Way galaxy containing the solar system, our sun and all the stars that you basically saw tonight would be comparable in size to the continent of North America. I mean, these galaxies are just enormous. So, and uh, there are thousands of them, thousands of these island universes, if you will, in the Virgo cluster, many of them larger than our Milky Way galaxy. So structure in the universe, you know, things don't like to travel alone in the universe, including not only our planet Earth with uh, the solar system or stars like our sun or star clusters like you saw earlier, but even galaxies. So our Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy are two separate island universes or galaxies that are part of something called the local galactic group. And it consists of about 54 galaxies. Now, our Milky Way and Andromeda are the largest in the local group along with Triangulum. Many of the other galaxies in our local group are, are so-called dwarf galaxies, much smaller. But you're talking about, you know, several galaxies that are gravitationally bound in a cube about 10 million light years across. So at the speed of light, you could orbit the Earth seven and a half times in one second, make a round trip to the moon in three seconds. It would take you 10 million years to cross the expanse of the local group containing Milky Way, our Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy. And our local group is actually part of a local supercluster of galaxies called the Virgo supercluster. And uh, you can see where our local group is here. And you've got other galaxy groups as well, such as the Fornax that's visible this time of year, uh, Erdanus, um, and then some of the other ones, including M101, the pinwheel galaxy, off the handle of the Big Dipper, that's not part of our local group. That's a galaxy outside of our local group, as is M81. But then you come over here to the Virgo cluster, and this is, again, thousands of galaxies, again, outside of our local group of galaxies. So the Virgo supercluster contains about 100 plus galaxy groups, and our local group of galaxies is just one of those, including the Virgo cluster, again, M81, M101, which are just single galaxies, and then the Fornax cluster. And this is about 110 million light years across. And that's actually part of an even larger supercluster. So galaxies like to travel in clusters. Galaxy clusters like to travel in superclusters. And then superclusters of galaxies like to travel in super superclusters. So that's kind of how the universe more or less is laid out. It's an oversimplification, but that's how structure forms on large scales hundreds of millions or even billions of light years. And uh, this supercluster here, if you can begin to wrap your mind around how large it is, it's only one of approximately 10 million superclusters in the observable universe. So here's the punchline. Uh, if you wanna learn the backyard night sky, go through the Messier catalog. And again, this is, as Adam talked about earlier, the greatest hits, if you will, of deep sky objects, 110 of them. And this time of year, if you wanted to, theoretically, you could knock out all 110 in one evening in something called a Messier Marathon. You want to start at dusk and go till dawn. Uh, if you're in the right location and good seeing conditions, you don't do them in order, but uh, there is a certain order where you could theoretically knock out all 110 in late March and early April. 
Now, 16 of these Messier objects are in the Virgo cluster, and they're all galaxies. Now, for the sake of time tonight, we're not going to go through all 16 of them. Uh, if you full spoiler alert here, if you want the full feature presentation, again, I'll be giving this next next Friday, April the first, for the Memphis Astronomical Society. But I'll kind of get you started here. If you look at the constellation Leo, which is the crouching lion off of you know, below the Big Dipper. It's prominent in the spring skies this time of year. You're looking uh, in this region of the sky right here between uh, the star Denebola at the tip of Leo and Vena de Maiatrix in, uh, in, in Virgo. And uh, right in here is just this rich region of, of galaxies. And it can take quite a bit of practice and skill to get these down. But uh, again, zooming in here, you got Denebola here, to kind of go through this and get this started, I'm going to draw a line from Denebola to the star 6com, which is actually right off of uh, Virgo. And that's where our journey into the Virgo cluster of galaxies begins. Now, if I draw lines, I'm basically just star hopping um, in almost like an arrow fashion, I can knock out three of these pretty quickly. Off of 6com, I've got the edge on spiral galaxy M98. And then I can star hop my way to M99, which is a face on spiral galaxy. And then I can star hop in the opposite direction up to M100, another bright face on spiral. So that's where we start. Now through the eyepiece of a basic Dobsonian telescope like my 10 inch, this is what it looks like. And again, this is a very basic good starter scope. You can see there 6COM um, where we begin our journey. If I move the eyepiece or my telescope just a little bit, you can see this faint fuzzy right here. This is actually the edge on spiral galaxy M98 in, uh, in the constellation Virgo. So that's one galaxy right there. Again, this is analogous to our Milky Way containing 100 billion to as many as 200 billion stars. And that's the bright star 6COM. If I go in the opposite direction, I can find M99. And again, it's a faint fuzzy. Galaxies right here are just very faint fuzzies in the eyepiece of your telescope. They're not as bright and sharp as stars are. But now I've just knocked out M99 and M98. And if I go in the opposite direction, again, doing a little star hopping, finding some of these bright stars along the path, I will stumble across um, M100. And this one bursts into the eyepiece. This is a very nice face on fairly bright spiral galaxy. And you'll know it when you see it. I mean, there's a lot of other galaxies in the Virgo cluster. You can see any faint fuzzy you see in the eyepiece of a telescope is basically a galaxy. But you can see here from the list of 16 Messiers, I've now, now quickly knocked out three of them, M98, M99, and M100. Now notice the distances here to these galaxies. Um, I've got some of them here in the, in the, uh, in the Virgo cluster that are 55 million light years away, 49, even 60 million light years away. So again, we're looking at light that has been traveling through space, almost going back to the time of the dinosaurs. That just really fascinates me, the, the immensity and the expanse of the visible universe. So that's where we start now. Uh, if you find M100, you can kind of star hop your way up again to a brighter star here. It's about, again, on our magnitude scale, about a fifth magnitude star, which means it is visible to the naked eye. You don't need a telescope, but it's very faint. This is a good analogy. Both 6COM and this star here are good analogies to what our sun would look like at the standard distance of 10 parsecs, which is how we measure absolute magnitude of stars. It would barely be visible to the naked eye. But if you can find that star and draw a straight line to this star here, and again, I'm just using the number configuration, the 11 star here to the 24 star, about midway through, you'll see two faint fuzzies and the brighter one is actually M85. And again, you'll know it when you see it in the eyepiece of a telescope. The Messiers are always a little brighter than the, uh, the NGC galaxies. And this is not a spiral galaxy, M85. It's actually a, uh, an elliptical galaxy, which means it's older, it doesn't have spiral arms. It's basically an uh, older, more evolved galaxy that's not developing any new stars. But I don't have any footage of this to show from the eyepiece of my telescope. 
but it's very distinct when you see it through your uh, telescope that you know you found this object because you'll see basically two of them right next to each other. And again, getting back to our list, we can knock that one off, M85. So we've knocked out four now out of 16 galaxies. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Um, what I'm gonna do to really get into the heart of the Virgo cluster is I'm just gonna draw a line from, again, bright Denebola at the tip of Leo the lion to Avena de Maitrix at the, uh, the edge of the Virgo, the, the constellation Virgo. And if I draw a line there and it's basically guess, I know I'm not gonna star hop my way here. I'm just gonna guess about where the midpoint is. And I'm just gonna place my telescope there. That's gonna bring me to the heart of the Virgo cluster. And I'll see this, it's a very distinct structure that I call the face, because it kind of looks like a face with two eyes, a nose and a mouth, even though the face is made of galaxies. But notice the eyes are two more lenticular galaxies in the Messier catalog. I've just knocked out M84 and M86. And this is the beginning of Markarian's chain, which I'll show you in more detail here in a second. So I've done that. So again, very quickly, just by guessing approximately where the midpoint is between these two bright stars, I've just knocked out M84 and M86. So that now gets me six of the 16 Messiers in the Virgo cluster. Now, where it gets interesting is if I travel just to the southwest, whatever direction you want to call it, off of the face, I can find M87. And uh, here's kind of a scaled out version here showing again, the beginning of Mark Harian's chain, the face structure that I just showed you with M86 and M84. This is M87. This is really the king of the, of the, uh, of the Virgo cluster, if you will. It's a very bright, powerful radio galaxy with about a trillion stars. And if you remember the news a few years ago, this is the galaxy where the first ever black hole was imaged with the Event Horizon Telescope. Imagine a network of telescopes, essentially the size of the planet Earth, using radio waves to image, if you will, a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. Well, that's M87. Just an incredible feat that we, that we can now see basically visual and empirical proof that black holes exist 100 years after Einstein predicted them from his theories of general relativity. So, and again, I'll show you this in, one, in the eyepiece of my telescope. And again, a very basic 10 inch daub with a night vision eyepiece. And you can see here the face structure. This is the M84 and M86. These are both bright lenticular galaxies. So I've got two Messiers now. And of course you can see here, this is NGC 4388. Now, if I move my telescope down, just kind of to the Southwest here, just off the face, and I don't have to move it very far, but as soon as I move it there, you'll be able to see um, where M87 is. And it'll pop into view here in just a second. You can see I'm kind of star hopping, but there it is. It's a very bright, fuzzy patch. And uh, again, stars are sharper and, and uh, more pinpoint than galaxies are. They're more of a, of, a, of a haze, if you will, but that's M87. So this is the galaxy now. It's about 55 million light years away where the first ever black hole was imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope. So that's right in the heart of the Virgo cluster. So again, getting back to my checklist, I've now knocked off number seven, and that's M87. So fairly quickly, I've gotten seven of the 16 Messiers uh, found. So now it gets a little more challenging from this point forward. I'm gonna sweep up this chain of galaxies called Markarian's chain and find my way to M88. And from there, what I'm gonna do, well, let's just show it here by blowing it up. Again, here's the face down here, M84, M86. And I'm gonna sweep up this chain of galaxies here. These are all NGC galaxies until I find this um, edge-on spiral galaxy, M88. And I know that I have found M88 because it has a very distinct pattern to it. Um, it doesn't have, you know, in, in a telescope, you're not gonna see this kind of detail in the galaxy. But what I will see are these two stars right off the disk on one side and a bright star on the opposite side. So when I see this pattern, I know that I've bagged M88. Now, once I do that, I can sweep around from M88 
to get M91, another face-on spiral, M90, an edge-on spiral. And then, uh, you know, here's another image of what M99, M90 looks like. Again, you don't see this kind of detail in the eyepiece of a telescope, but it'll be a brighter, basically edge-on spiral. Uh, M89, a lenticular, and then you can sweep your way back around to M87, which I showed you earlier. So let's just kind of show you more or less what this looks like. I didn't get every one of them in this in this clip, but again, we're back to the face, which is M84 to the upper right, M86 in the middle, M84, M86. And this is the face structure I was talking about earlier. So here's Markarian's chain. These two galaxies right here are actually called the eyes, and I forget the NGC designations. But if I sweep up this way, I can bring myself up to where M88 is. And I'll show you from this clip here of... Um, of what M88 looks like in the eyepiece of a telescope. So again, I have a Dobsonian, it doesn't track, I gotta do everything by hand. So I'm doing a little guesswork here. So I've gotta have knowledge, if you will, of um, the night sky. And of course, I'm showing you again, this is M87, what I showed you earlier, that bright, that, that bright galaxy, pretty easy to find once you found M80, M86 and M84. And then again, when I, uh, when I sweep my telescope back up toward uh, M84 and M86, the face, there it is. You can see it right there. And I actually call this galaxy the eyebrow of one of the eyes. Now, if I move it um, more or less in the direction of Markarian's chain, eventually I will find the, uh, the galaxy M88, and then I can find M91 and M90. Now, this is another. Again, this is an NGC galaxy. Here's another galaxy right here. There's another one right over there. You see a lot of galaxies in the Virgo cluster. That's why it's hard to keep them all straight. But the Messiers are typically brighter than um, the NGC galaxies because uh, the Messier catalog goes back again to the late 18th century. And, uh, and uh, you know, Charles Messier, when he found them, he was looking for comets. But Anyway, here you can see M88, very distinct edge-on spiral pattern. Again, bright core here, kind of the fuzzy disk, the two stars that I talked about earlier, and then the other brighter star on the opposite side of the disk. So when I see this very recognizable pattern, it's like, ah, okay, I've got it. I've bagged M88. Okay, so there's M88. And again, I didn't show you 91, 90, and 89, but you're just gonna have to kind of take my word for it. But here again, this is the image I showed you earlier. So this is kind of where we began. So labeling these galaxies, again, I've got M84, M86, the two eyes of the face, Markarian's chain here, which sweeps around. Here's the NGC 4459. And then eventually I can use Markarian's chain to find the edge on spiral M88. I can sweep around to find a face on spiral M91. And then eventually, find brighter M90, which is also an edge on spiral, and then back around to 89 and then back up to 87. So it kind of forms a big loop, if you will. And that's how I find those galaxies. Um, now it is a challenge. I'm, I'm, <laughs> this is something that requires a lot of time, a lot of practice, a lot of studying of star charts and a little bit of trial and error and a little bit of frustration. But um, that is essentially, my journey into the Virgo cluster. Now I'll end with this one. I'm not gonna talk about M59, M58 or uh, M60 because these are really challenging. And uh, that's, that's for, again, another version of this talk. But one thing you can do is you can find M49 fairly easily. Again, I do the same thing I did when I found M84 and M86. I just draw a line from Venda de Mitrix, basically to the, each of these bright stars, if you will, at the edge of Virgo, I look for this very recognizable double star pattern here, the Rho star. I think it's Rho, or is it Phi? My Greek letters, I think it's Rho, sorry. Then if I draw an arrow down, I can star hop my way to this very distinct pattern right here. And that's how I find M49. And this again, took a little bit of practice for me as well. But M49 is another bright lenticular galaxy. And when you find it, you just kind of know that you found it because it, um, it just is a bright fuzzy patch, if you will, 
in the eyepiece of your telescope. So that one was actually, it took a little bit of skill to get from, from here, basically down to this pattern here, these stars here, before I could actually find M49. But it was something I was, that I was able to do. So anyway, that is essentially my journey, if you will, into the Virgo cluster. 16 Messiers, I showed you nine of them, give or take. Um, six or seven of them are pretty easy. The rest of them are a challenge, but if you're up for a challenge, I'd recommend it. Billy, back to you. So is there going to be a quiz about how to, to get to each one of these before the night's over? <laughs> <laughs> I would never do that to anyone if, unless they wanted to study first. This is, this is taking uh, quite a bit of practice, but uh, it's, def it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge and it's definitely a necessity if you want to try and knock out all 110 of the Messiers. But, you know, that is uh, just a, a great example of why, you know, I always recommend that folks start out with the telescope that is not motorized, that you have to find things on your own because you learn the night sky so much better if you have to find these things uh, for yourself. And it's so much more satisfying when you actually do come across them. So, yeah, that was a, a really neat tour. I've never actually gone on a tour to see what you can see in just that small field of view of the Milky Way. So so thank you for, for taking us on that. Um, I don't think we have any questions at the moment, but uh, John Martin up at the uh, University of Illinois, uh, where you were doing uh, our tour, was taking some images of uh, that particular area. And I think that he's got the face right there. Excellent, John. Thank you. Speaking of homework. <laughs> he's what that we is call a beautiful shot. Well, it's clear, and so I thought I'd show us what we were looking at. This is this is uh, about 900 seconds of stacking right now, or about 15 minutes we're at at the moment. Wow. Great shot. That's a beautiful yeah. picture. That's it. Very impressive. Actually, uh, let's see. We've got two, t uh, two uh, questions that came through. First, which telescope were you using when you were giving us that tour? I was using a 10-inch Dobsonian and Orion telescope. So it's just a very basic dab. I didn't have the slide in there, but I bought that one used for 350 bucks, a new, a new telescope. That one would be about six or 700 new. Again, either an eight inch or a 10 inch Dobsonian is what I would recommend. Actually, let me do something here. Give me one second here. Okay. I was gonna say, if you don't have a picture handy, I know you've featured it in some of our previous star parties, in which we have those recorded and available yeah. on the website. So yeah. Definitely. So that's it. It's just my, my go-to starter scope. Okay. And let's see, there was another one. Uh, why are there so many galaxies in the direction of Virgo? It seems like the galaxies would be evenly distributed no matter where we look. Well, again, we're looking into a cluster of galaxies or I guess more a uh, super cluster of galaxies. So yeah, um, we're part of the local group. And, you know, we're traveling through space with about 50 or 60 galaxies, if you will. And we are actually gravitationally bound to the Virgo supercluster. In fact, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but we're falling into the Virgo mm -hmm. supercluster of galaxies. It'll be a little while before we get there, but eventually we will merge with that supercluster of galaxies. So you're not only looking at a galaxy cluster, you're kind of looking at a supercluster of galaxies. And I'll also add that folks that have done a lot of research um, in, in the fields of cosmology, where you know we start out with uh, what's known as a homogeneous universe, where matter is you know the universe is smaller, but matter is evenly distributed. They basically put in ingredients like um, hydrogen gas and uh, gravity, and now that we know it exists, dark matter as well. And they basically have supercomputers take that and say, okay, under the force of gravity, what's going to form out of this? And what we see is that instead of, you know, you're getting a very, very uniform universe, you get these filaments of galaxies. And so the supercluster is one of those filaments. And then you've got these voids where you don't really see much of anything in the galaxies, but, or in, the, in, in space, there's basically huge expanses where there might be just a couple galaxies. But uh, if you look at large enough scales and you look at some of these extremely deep surveys that are going out literally about 10 to 12 billion light years, you will see that the universe is roughly homogeneous. But when you start looking at a little bit smaller scales, that's when you start to see these, 
these uh, individual structures starting to form. And it kind of takes on, a, um, it's often like into a soap, a soap bubble pattern where the galaxies would lie along the, the membranes of the soap bubbles. And then there's the huge voids where we don't see as many of those galaxies. But then it really just depends on the scale that you're looking at. But when you go to large scales, things pretty much even out. Yep. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. So, uh, but I'll take this opportunity since we are a couple minutes over time to thank all of our presenters, uh, Tim Hallett, Theo Wellington, uh, Adam Thans, Jeremy Veldman, Dr. Uh, John Martin. Uh, thank you all so much. It was, it was uh, another fun program. I certainly enjoyed it, especially since we actually got to do some viewing and I just shut the dome because the clouds have now rolled in. So um, I just wanna thank everybody for all of your, your great presentations and for all of you joining us this evening. It's always a pleasure to, to be able to reach out to, to all of you. And we hope to continue doing these in the future. So just stay tuned to um, the Dyer Observatory website for announcements. All right, anybody have any final thoughts? Another great start right. party, very yeah. informative. Can't wait to watch the replay. Same here. So thank you again, everyone, and hope everyone has a great weekend. Have a great weekend, everyone. All right. Good night. All right. Good night.